Hi, everyone. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Hicks. Uh, Dr. Hicks is a philosopher and a professor. He's written for the Wall Street Journal and many other reputable publications, um, teaches at Rockford University, and soon, I believe, uh, doing some stuff for Peterson Academy, which maybe oh. we'll touch on a little bit. Uh, but the main reason uh, for our discussion today is uh, he's the author of Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, and um, was one of the first texts, actually, that I read in starting to explore sort of the domain of uh, theorizing the postmodern. Um, and uh, yeah, Dr. Hicks has his kind of own take on uh, this topic. And so I'd love to dig into some of this and um, discuss, debate, uh, converse. Uh, but before we get into any of that, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hicks. Really appreciate you. Being oh, here. no, real pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Great topic also. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a fascinating book. Um, and as I said, it was sort of one of the first that I'd read as I went looking mm -hmm. into trying to understand this topic. Um, and uh, I, I, I'd love to hear kind of you set it up a little bit for people. Um, I mean, certainly this is uh, it's not just sort of postmodernism explained. I think there's sort of a thoroughgoing critique. Uh, I'm not sure if you would you allow for that characterization of it, but it's a it's a um, a kind of interpretive framing of postmodernism that definitely um, sort of, I think, showcases a lot of the um, the 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 demerits and the 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 kind of shortcomings, I guess you could say, a lot mm. of the impasses and and, and the failures. Um, and so in that sense, it sort of foregrounds a lot of that. And I'd love to, towards maybe the latter half of this conversation, uh, also explore the potential merits or um, things potentially of worth in the postmodern paradigm and see how something like that might be uh, able to be integrated into something that comes after postmodernism. Sure, sure. But um, yep. yeah, just to start us off, so set this up a little bit. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, Talking about postmodernism, we've got to talk about modernity, uh, and that really, you know, characterizes this rupture, this break from the pre-modern past. So, anytime right. we talk yep. about postmodernism, we have to kind of work with uh, pre-modern, modern, postmodern, post um, yep. and uh, and so talk a little bit about first just some, you know, the shift into modernity and the role that the Enlightenment played, because I think that that's really important for how you frame right. uh, postmodernism. Yeah. No, absolutely. So uh, postmodern, uh, sorry, as you're suggesting, comes after modern or it's a rejection of the modern. That's uh, that's an interpretive move right there. And then both the, the modern and the postmodern position them in, self in part against the pre-modern. So what we have is both, uh, both historical categories saying that ideas and history have moved in a certain direction and then uh, an emphasis on the philosophical ideas that seem to have the are, that are the center of gravity in each of these eras so i'm a philosopher by training so for me the taxonomical schema i use is to say uh each of these eras is going to be characterized by a certain metaphysics a certain understanding of the nature of reality and it's going to be characterized by an epistemology. So you can say what's real, but the immediate follow-up question always is, well, how do you know that? So as a philosopher, you have some account of knowledge. And whatever you believe to be true or reasonable or probable, you have some justificatory story about that. Also, philosophers are concerned about ourselves in particular, what it is to be a human being in the world. So an understanding of human nature, and then uh, the value questions, uh, you know, like, so what? What's what's the point? What's good? What's bad? What are we supposed to, to, to do? So a standard philosophical taxonomy then is to characterize uh, an individual philosopher or a philosophical school or a movement in terms of its metaphysics, its epistemology, its views on human nature, and its value framework, its ethics or, or, and or social philosophy. So the rupture, uh, I like that word, uh, we call the, the, the break between modernity and uh, uh, its earlier pre-modern world. Uh, uh, that needs to be explored. And why is, sometimes we call it a rupture is that there was a dramatic, uh, in historical time, sometimes a generation or two, sometimes merely a century, which is very short in historical time, transformations in the key ideas in certain areas, right? Uh, and in many cases, followed by uh, changing of social and cultural practices that happened in a, in a fast period of time. So if we say, for example, uh, before and after Columbus, 
right? Uh, the way people understand the world and their position in the world, that's that's a revolutionary event. Uh, uh, the Protestant Reformation uh, and its dramatic transformation in how, at least at first, how Europe did religion, that's a dramatic transformation in a mm. fast period of time. Uh, the beginnings of science, uh, thinkers like Copernicus and the revolution, how you think about instead of we are at the center of God's plan for the universe to being a satellite orbiting the main center. That's a, another dramatic shift. So modernity uh, is by philosophers and historians typically dated. And then, of course, we have all of the arguments from the 1400s to, say, 1600 or so. And here you've got people like Copernicus, Columbus, Michelangelo, Martin Luther, Andreas Vesalius doing landmark studies in anatomy. Uh, you have the early uh, philosophers and scientists, uh, also like Galileo, Francis Bacon, Rene Descartes. And so all of them are within a century or so. And uh, cumulatively, there then is a transformation of cultural and intellectual life. Arguments are engaged, arguments are won, and the world goes off in a, in a different direction. Now, then to get more analytical, that's the historical framing, to say, what does this mean philosophically? And then we start to say, well, uh, metaphysically, what are we talking about? And then we say something like, for a thousand years or so in the West, the dominant metaphysical framework was a religious one. And it was a strongly religious one in a dualistic sense. There's this world, the physical world, and there's a higher world. This world is lower. That world is higher. This world is imperfect. That world is perfect. Uh, this world is material. That world is spiritual. In many cases, they are opposed to each other. Mm -hmm. So you have a a kind of religious metaphysics that tends to devalue or outright dismisses the natural world, that sees it as derivative of uh, and cannot be explained except in terms of a superior or a supernatural world, that is, that is God. And so what you had for many centuries was a more or less unquestioned axiom that there is a God that God is all-powerful, God created the world, that what happens in the world is God having written a script of sorts, and everything uh, follows from that script, right, and so on. Now, that metaphysics comes to be challenged in the early modern world, and then the, the, the revolution is that the dominant thinkers are thinking first and foremost in terms of the natural world. Now, it's not that we are necessarily dismissive of the existence of a supernatural world, although that starts to be questioned, but we're not going to start with the supernatural world and kind of derive everything from it. We're going to start with the natural world. And this is what the early scientists were doing, what the early philosophers were doing in the modern world. And then we will understand the world in its own terms as a causal world. And perhaps there's input from a god occasionally but maybe not. We're, we're going to see how far we can go explaining the natural world without reference to God's uh, uh, the miracles, uh, interventions, God's plans, and, and so on. That's a major philosophical shift. Now, epistemologically, uh, if you go back to the pre-modern, again, thinking of the, the thousand uh, years earlier, yeah, and you ask the big, how do I know question. The dominant epistemology in pre-modern times is to say, first and foremost, uh, truth is what is in God's mind, but God reveals that truth to certain special individuals who are prophets, who are receivers of revelations, various of them. And that is the ultimate source and valorization of what we take to be knowledge. And so philosophically, we say it's a kind of mysticism uh, that is the dominant epistemology. Now, typically in the pre-modern world, uh, the idea was that there were very few uh, individuals selected by God for this. And so that means that the vast majority of people do not have access to knowledge, like genuine sources of knowledge. They have to rely upon the prophets, right? and they should have faith in the prophets and or the established institutions that have been based on what the prophets have said. So you have then an epistemology that is characterized by mysticism fundamentally, and then faith 
uh, in this cognitive sense. Uh, and uh, there might be a role for reason after the fact, giving supporting arguments for your, your faith position or the revelations, but it's definitely derivative. Now, in the early modern world, that also is subject to critique and revelation, or sorry, revolution, not revelation. <laughs> So what we find then is to say, oh no, we do, we don't start with uh, you know turning off our senses and, and and trying to ask God to speak directly to our souls. Instead, we use our senses, we observe the world, and we see the early artists doing this, the early scientists doing this, the early philosophers starting to do this increasingly, and to say that is a more secure and proper foundation for knowledge. The idea also then is that rather than faithfully accepting what the authorities have told us, we should think for ourselves, you know, based on our own experience, uh, uh, having arguments uh, with, uh, with previous texts, being willing to disagree with them, being willing to disagree with authorities, and then ultimately trusting the judgment of our own minds. Now, to the extent then that we have a shift epistemologically to the leading intellectual saying, use your senses, observe the world, use your own reason, use your own judgment, and that this is pretty widespread. Pretty much everybody can do this. That is an epistemological revolution that happens in a relatively fast uh, period of time. When we turn to issues of human nature, what is it to be a human being? Again, there's a revolution here because partly the uh, understanding of human being well, in the pre-modern world was a thoroughly dualistic one. We are creatures, first and foremost, that are a soul or a spirit. We're made in the image of God. We interpret that metaphor in various ways. Or, you know, like a, God took the dust of the earth and breathed, which is metaphorical for spirit. So we have the spirit in us, and that's what makes us who we are. And our body is merely a temporary vessel uh, you know, for, for what we're supposed to be doing here on earth. But eventually, the soul will separate from the body and go to its true destiny. So that dualistic understanding of human beings also starts to be challenged in the early modern world, where we start to do anatomical studies, which had been forbidden for many centuries. And we start to see the human being as a mechanical system. And we start to recognize that what happens apparently in the mind or in the soul or in the spirit is triggered by events that are happening in the body and perhaps is reducible to them. So you start to see more forms of a naturalistic understanding of the human being, sometimes even reductively materialistic understandings of human beings. And that maybe we have a soul, uh, you know, we'll make an argument for that and we'll continue to look scientifically for the existence of a soul or to understand the mind in more naturalistic terms. And that's uh, also quite revolutionary. Uh, there's also a, a, a crossover point here that when we are in the pre-modern, there's also a value assumption about human nature. That's the sin assumption. It's not you know, only that we are dual creatures, that in some sense, though, that we are sold into a kind of slavery to the physical world or the physical world's attractions, and that even though we are supposed to know better we indulge our sexual appetites, our food appetites, our desires for money, and so forth. Uh, and so we indulge the body when we uh, should be focusing only on our soul and getting ourselves, ourselves ready, ready for that. And that we also carry this collective guilt across the generations for what our ancestors did way back, way back in time. Increasingly, also, that view comes to be challenged, and it gets replaced by the view that people are born morally with a blank slate that rather you know than an inheriting sin <laughs> you, know, you, you, uh, you if you're going to sin that's on you right but other people's sin isn't necessarily on you and that's a, a a dramatic transformation in the benevolence with which we view human beings in the in the early modern in the early modern world uh, uh so the sinfulness then gets replaced by either a tabula tabula rasa view or even in some cases a view that we're born inherently good. Maybe we have a mixture of good and bad traits, but really it's the good ones that prevail and, and when we can, we can trust human beings. Now, all of this then leads to a value shift. Once you start to say the natural world matters, then you start to value things in the natural world more and you start to 
pay less attention in your ethics to saying it's all about salvation and what happens in the afterlife. There starts to be an emphasis on flourishing and being successful in the uh, in the in the physical world, to being able to enjoy physical things in the world without guilt, have a good sex life, eat well, become rich. Those are not uh, stigmas that then be attached to or, or just guilty secrets that you have to indulge once in a while. So we start to valorize the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of wealth. And that, of course, also has uh, big, big, uh, big implications. So what we then have is a four way contrast on, on the metaphysics between a pre-modern center of gravity uh, that had dominated for, you know, again, we can argue about the dates, but for about a millennium. And then in the course of just a century or two, all of that gets engaged, argued about. And then by the time we are clearly into the late 1500s, early 1600s, we're into a different intellectual world. And that's modernity philosophically. Yeah. Wow. That was a uh, tour de force there. It's quite uh, eloquent uh, and articulate and concise Thanks. expression Thanks. of a, yeah, a thousand year uh, philosophical transformation of worldviews. So mm. um, so that's great. I mean, that, that paints the picture very vividly of this transformation from the pre-modern to the modern perspective. And um, and, and, and I want to kind of also uh, like for me, when when I, I hear that narrative, which I I mean, I think that that's a a great way to express that narrative. And I, I basically uh, give my own version of that in, in my own writing. Um, but there is this sort of uh, interpretation of that narrative as one of progress, which it's understandable yeah. to see why it's, uh, you know, a moving towards the embrace of human happiness, uh, greater knowledge about the natural world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that I is a just big... jump in on that, right? Yeah. That, that's an argument, an additional argument that has to be made because precisely as uh, some, I would include myself in that category. So that is, in fact, progress. There are, of course, those who say, no, no, no this is regression. <laughs> right, right. And that's right. what I wanted. I, I, we're we're I, abandoning I, various. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, so, so all we're doing is right now intellectual history. Sure. The, the philosophical evaluation of the various positions is an additional thing we need to do. Yeah. And I and that's kind of what I'd, I'd love to dig into a bit, especially because your your book explaining postmodernism, I think, is it certainly evaluative in that sense. So, um, you know, uh, people who watch this uh, podcast, I think will have a general sense of that intellectual history. Uh, but it's very fascinating the way that people uh, frame and theorize these transformations as well and make broader sense about them. Uh, the facts, so to speak, are there, but then it's sort of like, how do we interpret them? Um, and it's also really, I think, crucial for understanding what, what postmodernism is about and what it means, because if there is this um, interpretation of a progress narrative, uh, then a lot of what uh, seems to come about with this postmodern turn that responds and reacts and rejects modernity is largely to undermine or to reject that narrative of progress. Exactly. Yep. And yep. um, so I think so we're we're kind of we're at that point now. And, and this is where I think that this book really is what it, a lot of what it's exploring, which is sort of um, uh, what what does postmodernism signify as a transition away from the modern kind of enlightenment narrative to a different narrative? And, and what is it responding to and why? Um, and so, yes. yeah, maybe pick up that a little bit. How do we then get from this modern enlightenment narrative to uh, how you understand uh Postmodernism, right? So the uh, the point about progress that you uh, you put out there is exactly the right point because the the modern philosophers and scientists and other cultural thinkers uh, did then say uh, that we are advocating positions that are true and that they are good, and on the basis of that, they become much more optimistic and they have an understanding of history that's also. Uh, uh, revolutionary. So rather than seeing history as the good old days, God made a perfect world and human beings have progressively messed it up. So it's a story of decline. Or sometimes uh, uh, there was this uh, a cyclical understanding of history that sometimes things get a little better, but necessarily it will decline and better and right. So, so you start to see uh, a sense among the modern thinkers as they they start to congratulate themselves and say, we have become enlightenment or enlightened and so the whole era comes and that is to say we've gotten past the superstition and all of the dogmas and the pessimism about human nature that has held us back and kept our lives short and miserable so we can in fact make people freer uh, wealthier uh live longer 
have less pain in their lives. And those are all good things. That's a value judgment that we are making. Uh, and so we are progressive. And so uh, the Enlightenment view, putting all of that philosophy together is, in addition to that, an extraordinarily optimistic about their own achievements and about the, the future of the, the world. So science and freedom and capitalism and democratic Republican institutions and making all human beings free and equal and so forth, those are going to make all of us better off. And so that was the projection that they that they that they they made. Now the postmodern, uh, now are, again, we're going to jump a couple of centuries. And uh, on my reading, the postmoderns, the most important ones, are uh, people who are coming to intellectual maturity in the 1950s. And then by uh, the early 1960s, they've made their mark in their various intellectual professions. So here I'm thinking of people like Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida and Richard Rorty and uh, Jacques Francois Lyotard. Those are the ones I, I judge to be mm -hmm. the most, uh, the, the heavyweight of the heavyweights in the, uh, the postmodern pantheon. Uh, but what has happened then between the age of enlightenment? So we say this turn starts from pre-modern to modern, 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, and then we get into what is classically called the age of enlightenment in the 1700s. So industrial revolution, there's the political revolutions in America, in France, and others inspired by those in other parts of the world. There's the amazing pushback against slavery that starts to happen in the 1700s. The first push for women having the same liberty and equality rights as men happening in the 1700s. Adam Smith and uh, writing the first kind of capitalist economics treatise in the 1770s and so on. So all of these revolutions are, are, are going on in the 1700s. But then uh, on my reading, there's the beginnings of a philosophical counter-revolution that begins. And that works its way out over the course of the next two centuries. It doesn't take three or four centuries this time. It takes only two centuries. And then by the time we get to, say, the 1950s, certainly by the 1960s, in high academic philosophy and some closely related fields, there has been another philosophical revolution. And that revolution reaches the conclusion explicitly that the Enlightenment was a mistake philosophically, culturally, politically, that we need to reject it and move beyond it. And so the entire modern world, they say, was wrong, has reached its kind of negative results by the time we get to the middle part of the 20th century. So it's not just a philosophical problem, it's also a cultural problem, these ideas being put into practice. We have a, a, a negative view of what the accomplish, uh, the Enlightenment has wrought uh, culturally and practically. And so philosophically and uh, in terms of practical, I don't want to say activism quite yet, but a practical uh, reaction to what's going on in the world the Enlightenment has created. We need to go beyond that. We need to go post. We reject it philosophically. We reject it uh, culturally as well. Now, to come back then to our philosophical categories, um, metaphysically, on my reading, what the postmoderns are doing is saying it makes no sense to do metaphysics. Right, so it's a skeptical position or a dismissive position with respect to metaphysics. And so we see this in some philosophical uh, 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 heavyweights uh, as far back as, say, you know, Bertrand Russell in the, in the teens and the logical positivists. Uh, we're talking explicitly about metaphysical questions have no answer and they are unanswerable. And then the logical positivists a little bit later and some of the early analytics saying that they are even meaningless questions. And so what you should do is just uh, set those set those uh, those 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 concepts well, aside. Qu so quick question uh, on that yes. front. Yeah, just to clarify that because I wonder what that means sometimes um in terms of if already the enlightenment project in enlightenment philosophy had already sort of turned its sights to the natural world and sort of, you know, self-consciously stopped asking the the kinds of questions that you know uh, get caricatured as like how many 
angels can dance on the head of a pin, which would be sort of the quintessential metaphysical question, um, you could say, then how does that turn differ from the kind of modern notion of moving away from metaphysics? Like what is meant by what's different when the logical positivists say it, these questions have no answers compared to what right. the Enlightenment thinkers were saying? Oh, just because there's always been two conceptions of metaphysics. Uh, you know, if we push it all the way back, there's a more platonic, otherworldly metaphysics, and there's a more Aristotelian metaphysics. So metaphysics, as I'm using it, just means what are your is your general, your most general understanding of the nature of reality. And so then what we can have is a supernaturalistic metaphysic, as we, as we've described, or a naturalistic metaphysics. So it's the difference between saying God is spirit, God makes the rules, God can intervene versus saying, and that, that's a general statement about the way the world works versus saying the world is physical and it operates according to cause and effect. That's also a very general statement about the nature of reality. So what the postmoderns are doing is to say both of those metaphysics are false or more dramatically both of those metaphysics are meaningless. So that we've mm. been uh, so they reach certain skeptical conclusions. They say for millennia now, philosophers have been trying to answer the question, what is reality? And all of the different routes that they have explored have reached dead ends. So rather than saying, uh, well, we just need to try a new approach, they are reaching the general conclusion of saying, what the history shows is that this is a fruitless and pointless approach. Right. So we should reject the entire understanding of metaphysics as uh, asking real questions or even meaningful questions. So yeah. rather than saying, what's the nature of reality? Is it spiritual or is it physical? We will be anti-realist and say that we're just not going to ask the question, what is reality? So right. it's a okay. dismissive. Okay. Yeah. And I think that as a, a characteristic postmodern move. And so this is something that Derrida signs on to when he says, for example, uh, everything is language. There's no getting outside of the text. That is to say, so there is no, so to speak, reality out there, God reality or science kind of reality that the language is referring to. Instead, we're just into language and narratives. And, and, and so it's a self-contained, and we don't ask the question about an external reality. That's an anti-realist position. Okay, so then uh, epistemologically, the, the, if we then say the pre-moderns wanted to say we can acquire genuine knowledge if, we, if God speaks to us, if we have a mystical revelation, we can acquire genuine knowledge if we have faith, strong faith in the proper revelations or the proper traditions. The moderns, by contrast, are saying we can have knowledge if we show that it's based on sensory experience or if we have the right array of experiments and logical integrations of the results and we've proved the results so we can get genuine knowledge. The postmodern claim, again, it's going to be a negative claim. They say that all of those proposed methods have been found wanting. They're all failures. And so, again, what we should do is not claim knowledge. And so the, the idea that we know in any traditional sense is false. The idea that we can be objective and come to know objective truth, that has to be rejected. The idea that there are such things as certainties, any positive epistemological concept has been investigated, found wanting. Uh, we have skeptical arguments that undermine each and every one of them. And so, again, we do a generalization. There is no such thing as knowledge, no such thing as objectivity, no such thing as truth. And so, again, we retreat, and then we start to say we have story language and narrative language, and that is characteristic of the, of the, uh, of the postmodern. So it's, a, a, again, distinct position from modernism and from postmodernism on, on both of those. Now, if we turn to issues of human nature, uh, uh, both the pre-modern tradition and the modern tradition, by and large, said, had said there is such a thing as human nature. Right? That, for example, what makes you you is the possession of an immortal soul. 
right? Well, that would be the pre-modern answer. Or what makes you you is that you are a particular physical collection of chemicals that are supporting a large brain that's supporting a large, and so, uh, and that works according to certain physical and chemical and biological laws that science can study. So we can have a science of human nature, uh, and that's the modern answer. So what the postmoderns want to do is to argue there is no such thing as human nature, right? There is no soul. There is no because that's all to make claims about reality that's out there, and we can't we can't do that. There's also been a, this is not as universal or quite as strong a theme, but the idea uh, of individuality that in many of the pre modern traditions the idea was that you have an individual soul that God made us each as a unique individual, and we each have an individual responsibility for the state of our soul. And the goal is for us as individuals, you know, perhaps to merge with other individuals and, and, and reconnect with God. But that still is my individual quest. And what makes me me is my individual soul. And then also in modernism, the strong notion of individualism that you are, you know, you, have, you might have a blank slate, but you are the one who writes on that blank slate. You form your character you become a good person, a bad person, you make your fortune, you go bankrupt or whatever it is. You as an individual will vote and you take that individual responsibility seriously. So these individualism is also something that we find in the postmodern world attacked and critiqued. And so the individual tends to get dissolved into various deterministic forces, social forces. And then we start to see the individual as constructed by whatever happened to be the prevailing linguistic and or social forces. And again, that's a very distinctive from pre-modern and modern understanding of what it is to be, to be a human being. When we turn to, uh, to value issues, um, the idea that there is kind of an ultimate good in the universe, if we take uh, again, this is not quite as general because some versions of pre-modern religious philosophy will say that the, there's not a happy ever after ending for everyone. Lots of people end up in hell and burning and so on. But the idea here is that there is a possible happy ever after. There is a, an, an, a standard of good to strive for. There are ideals in this other world. Some of us will realize those ideals. So there is a kind of idealism that still is built into that. And the same thing in the modern world, that it becomes an individual responsibility. It's much more naturalistic. But the pursuit of happiness and the idea of living long and living well as a, a realistic ideal for human beings to strive for. And then the, along that with that, the progressive understanding of history that, uh, that we mentioned before. What we find in postmodernism is a pretty thorough rejection of any sort of optimism or progressive understanding of human destiny. Typically, what we're left with is a more conflict model uh, that all human beings in various groups are in conflict with each other. We're all, uh, uh, we all have agendas, we're all wearing masks. Uh, and, and it's a much more cynical understanding that people might talk the talk in their narrative about you know, progress and God loving us and democracy for everybody, but really those are covers for underlying nasty power plays that are you know, the true social reality. And when we project a future, there's not really a happy ever after. It's that forever, so to speak. It's just going to be ongoing power struggles, the strong dominating the weak, sometimes the weak getting their act together and and and, and carving out some some uh, some small victories for themselves. But it's an it's an it's kind of an unending, unpleasant conflict story that typically is is portrayed so again if we put all of that together the anti-metaphysics the pessimistic epistemology the, the 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 narrative social construction understanding and collectivized understanding of human beings and this negative story about values that's a very different philosophical world if you put that all together that's my understanding of the the intellectual core of postmodernism excellent thank you so yeah okay so you've offered this like very robust taxonomy um, yeah. and, and, and that's sort of, Thanks. yeah, of course. I mean, and, and that's great. And so we've got that to work with then and granting all that um, one of the big questions then that kind of emerges from, from, 
this discussion for me and from your book in particular, right, is that how do we interpret it? And here I do want to kind of dig into some of the evaluative aspects because we can have the history and the facts and try to make sense of basically the broad patterns and paradigms. Um, but uh, but but then in terms of sort of like the meta level, um, the theory about what this signifies and where we're going in particular yeah. uh, is, is where I get really interested in. And, you know, uh, my interest a lot being in meta modernism, which is a form of post post modernism, um, uh, for me signifies that there's something that comes after post modernism, and mm -hmm. uh, that in some way it has to integrate in some to some degree some of the novelties of of post modernism itself. And I wanted to ask you about that idea because um, and you end uh, I think like the last page of the book is is. Uh, the section heading is post postmodernism, and there's sort of a gesture to, you know, uh, yeah. moving on beyond this. Um, so I guess my question, I'd set it up like this. When I read uh, your your work on the topic, uh, I get a sense of, uh, yeah, as you said, like there is this sort of progress narrative that you uh, that you would affirm. But then when you get to sort of moving beyond the modern and into the postmodern, it seems like, you know, oh, what a falling off was there. <laughs> it's sort of like, a, oh, man, we really kind of took a detour into a really nasty area. So one of my questions up front would just be, given all of the stuff that you've presented and, the, and that you talk about in the book, what about the postmodern paradigm do you see uh, as a valuable critique of the modern, right? Uh, yeah. Especially coming into the 20th century when there were two great world wars, when we're in a current situation with, you know, environmental troubles and um, and there are, you know, ongoing still uh, political um, uh, tensions, deep tensions around race and forms of bigotry, et cetera, um, that, uh, that, that it seems that, uh, certain forms of that critique maybe do land. And, and, and so, yeah, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that in terms of like, were there anything that right. the postmoderns got right in their critiques of the, of the modern? Yeah, no, that's a, a big, uh, uh, I was keeping notes here. I think you have about four questions packed into that very nice, <laughs> nice story. <laughs> Answer any any uh, no, no. collection of them and, you'd and, like. <laughs> and all of them are are, are great questions. So uh, I think there's one danger in using these labels, uh, modern, postmodern, and pre-modern, and so on, to say that, uh, that they map onto history uh, precisely and totally. So... I think it's an additional question when we move out of the intellectual realm, say this is what has happened in the evolution of philosophical ideas. Mm. And we might then delineate these three packages, modern, postmodern, and pre-modern, and so on. What kind of impact have they actually had in the modern, or sorry, in the world, uh, so to speak? So I would say then, if we start in the 1700s, obviously there were a series of revolutions that occurred scientific, engineering, medical, political, economic, right, and uh, slavery and women's status, right, and so on. Uh, but that's not to say that just because those ideas were dominant and uh, successful by their own lights, that they were the only ideas that were current. So there still were pre-moderns, as yeah. we would call them sure. philosophically, and uh, for the most part, they remained a minority movement on through the mind, uh, through the uh, through the modern world. But they still are there. And every time there is a crisis or a major problem, what they will do is to say, see, in this modern enlightened world, we went and we started to do this. And now we have this problem and it's the fault of and the enlightenment. And so we need to go back to our right. pre-modern understanding. And then postmoderns will do a variation on that. They will say, yeah, we rejected pre-modernity. We're fine with that. But the modern world has created its own new set of problems. And those are unsolvable problems by, according to modernism. And we don't want to go back to pre-modernism. So we need to go to postmodern. So uh, I think that's an ongoing dynamic. And what we have always, all through the 20th century and on into our own era is a three-way intellectual debate. There are lots of vigorous yeah. pre-moderns, moderns, and, and post-moderns, and they're all blaming each other for, <laughs> for the various problems. Right? Uh -huh. uh, okay, So we have to drill down then, I think, to uh, the specific problems and do a lot of them on a case-by-case -case basis. So what do we say about the cause of World War I? And whom, whom do we blame for that? What do we say about 
uh, environmental issues. What do we say about transgenderism and so on, or social media crises and, and so on? And it might not be the case that it's the same answer in each of those cases, because right. we might say the Enlightenment was successful on these eight cultural fronts in varying degrees, but it was less successful on these other two cultural fronts. And, and uh, so we can't just do armchair philosophy and deduce everything from from the philosophical uh, philosophical positions. Now, as for uh, the, uh, 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 that was part of your first and part of your third question, a question about uh, what something beyond postmodernism would look like. Again, I think what we would need to do is do all of the philosophical work then to say, if we think modernism uh, and the enlightenment is characterized say by these 15 positions in philosophy, and postmodernism is characterized by the opposite, say, on those 15. And then go through one by one and just say, well, I think the moderns are better on this one and then the postmoderns are better on this one and so on. And then on the basis of that, that's something that each of us intellectually is doing anyway. We would put together our own package that might be varying degrees of mixtures of modern and, and postmodern. So I think that is an open project that we are always uh, going to be engaged in. I think we're, uh, I say we're, we're always be engaged in because I think these issues are perennial issues. You know, what's the nature of reality, knowledge, human beings, and so on. And we're always going to be as alert young people, especially when we're learning these things, uh, people who will consider all of the answers to all of them before making up our own minds. So we'll have the ongoing uh, uh, mixtures, right, and, and, and so on. But. If we stay at a fairly high level, if we say postmodernism is characterized by anti-realism metaphysically, skepticism epistemologically, deep skepticism, a thoroughly socially constructed, collectivized understanding of human nature, and a conflict and pessimistic power struggle understanding of values, then my answer would be nothing is good in postmodernism. Mm -hmm. So I would say yeah. uh, at that level of philosophical abstraction, I reject all four of those. Sure. Now, when we go over to the modern side, I am quite willing to say that modernism is has been an evolving... So if we say naturalism is true, and I think that's true, but that's a very high level, but there still are going to be 30 or 40 possible understandings of what mm. the natural world looks like right and that's going to be the ongoing scientific project of physics and chemistry and biology and psychology to work out and i will as an individual sign on to some particular variations on that and the same thing when we turn to uh, at a high level saying well i think empirically we start with the senses that we form conceptual abstractions and we go on to do more uh, robust logic and theory building. I think that's true. But again, uh, working out how the senses work, how we form abstractions, uh, the, the nature of logic, the nature of scientific methodology, the mathematics that supports it. Again, there are dozens of sub-theories trying to work all of that out. Some of them I think are better. Some of them I think are worse. So that's going to be an ongoing sorting process. So I sign on to the modern package in general but then there are going to be dozens and dozens of debates among various modernist versions for supremacy. And I just see that's just the ongoing yeah. scientific project that I, as a philosopher of the Enlightenment, would say is the nature of the beast. Yeah. No, I that I think that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, one of the things that it feels like to me is that... Um, that a big part of the problem is just uh, emphasis and sort of uh, certain relative things becoming absolutized. And what I mean by that is yeah. well, um, that's, that's well said, very well said. Yeah. And so part of what <laughs> I think can be genuinely progressive about moving through certain intellectual impasses or 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 even making progress on the front <laughs> of intellectual history is to acknowledge the kernel of truth that might be in uh, a given response or a critique but not radicalizing it or absolutizing it right so well, that, like i think like, that's exactly right yeah yeah and so, so to so that you're... degree I, I would just kind of ask like um if 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 the postmoderns in doing uh this sort of radical skepticism and anti-realism etc 
uh, if that does just go too far and sort of just, you know, throw all the babies out with the bathwater, uh, is there a degree to which some of those critiques hold merit and could be properly integrated uh, into uh, continued engagement with modern ideas while there's right. sort of a shared understanding that, like, if you go too far in either of these directions, you're okay. going to have trouble, something like right. that. So, no, I, I like that formulation very much. So the idea here is, if we say you know, skepticism, and I'm just going to put it in quotation marks, I, I think uh, there's a healthy form of skepticism that is part and parcel of modern philosophy. Uh, so the idea that we should challenge, say, a dogmatic assumption that God exists, uh, that, uh, 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 that, that this book has all of the revealed truths. And what we replace that with then also should be questioned and challenged and should be challenged by every thinking person as he or she's coming to coming to adulthood. So the idea of questioning and considering all of the skeptical arguments that can be raised, I think that is, is properly healthy, but that is built into modernism. So Descartes with his method of hyperbolic doubt, Locke and Bacon both saying we have to be very sensitive to not stating more than the evidence uh, has suggested and be considered and being open to other ways of framing that evidence uh, and comparing them against each other and being willing to say, as Bacon does explicitly at the beginning of the modern project, I might be wrong about lots of things right? and I want you to feel welcome to challenge them. And these are not a literal quotation, but this is exactly what he's saying. Uh, I want you to challenge me on whatever points you think need challenging and suggest alternative hypotheses as well. So that's built into modern philosophy, and I think it's built into the science ethos that was developed in modernity. So that's kind of a small s skepticism or a, a healthy culture of critique. And it's also devolved to the individual, that each individual ultimately is going to make up their own mind. And it doesn't matter if you are a junior professor, you can challenge the senior professor and the student can challenge the teacher and so on. So the way you're talking uh, about that becoming absolutized by the postmoderns, I think that's right. Because what the postmoderns then do is say, rather than we're going to look at all of the skeptical objections and see what stands. And then if we have a skeptical objection to a particular hypothesis that we think is fatal, well, we'll will abandon that hypothesis. And what the moderns then will do is to say, well, I guess what we need to do is find a better hypothesis. But what the, uh, the postmoderns are doing is to say that means we should stop trying to come up with new hypotheses or think that we can get a better or a truer or a more objective understanding. So in a way, they are taking skeptical critiques and absolutizing them. They're saying absolutely no theory can be true. We're going to throw truth mm -hmm. out. We're going to throw objectivity out and so on. So yes. Yeah. Um, small s skepticism, fine, but not the thoroughgoing absolutist skepticism that's right. with the uh, postmoderns. Well, see, and this this is interesting and, and a good place to kind of you know start to to close the conversation at because again, I'm I'm very fascinated by these meta modern formulations uh, that are trying to uh, appreciate the values of all these different worldviews while also recognizing that they're uh, you know that there might be partial truths, but also uh, some are more right than others on certain things, let's say. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and to appreciate too, that, that, um, that each of them might be offering something of value to the sort of broader uh, intellectual landscape. And um, so when you're talking about skepticism, I've really enjoyed the work of Jason Storm, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with him at all, uh, but what his project is sort of a systematic philosophical engagement with uh, the postmodern um, uh, sort of paradigm uh, and, and philosophically working through it by sort of applying postmodernism's own precepts to itself to get to something mm. else on the other side. So what he does is sort of like propose that we need, to, we need to sort of doubt skepticism or be, you know, small s skeptical about big s capital, you know, skepticism. Um, and you can do this in many ways, right? Uh, that you can start to see that that what the postmodern paradigm was sort of taking as like the all out absolute when it, you kind of reduplicate its own logic onto itself, um, you get something productive and you you get something affirmational rather than just critical and and deconstructive. Mm, okay. uh, it's a very okay. fascinating thing. But 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 generally that that idea there is just uh, something that I find valuable and to try to as much as possible um, 
integrate where possible. Uh, and the where possible is key because there are certain many aspects of the postmodern paradigm that simply do become untenable, unworkable, or just sort of end in, you know, aporia and impasse. Um, and so we do need to move beyond those pitfalls. But I also feel like there's almost, a, uh, you could even just say a strategic value of living in a very postmodernized world uh, to try to sort of uh, engage postmodern thought where it's at, but still try to move beyond it. And to me, that always requires some degree of uh, working with what's there. Um, and, uh, and you know, so that it's, yeah. yeah. I, I would say at that level of generality, what you've described, I'm totally on board with that. And I, but I think that is part and parcel of the modernist epistemology. Mm. So the idea that whatever the, 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 the previous uh, philosophies and worldviews that came down and all of the current ones, it will be the mark of an intellectually responsible person to consider all of them uh, and to look explicitly for what might be good elements in each of them uh, and to be willing to take whatever received view uh, that you acquired from your professors, from your parents and so forth, and put it through the critical lens genuinely and come up with your own repackaging. So I think that's uh, uh, a modernist ethos mm. and a, a, a part of modernist epistemology. And it would then extend to whatever critiques are coming out of postmodernism. So uh, I do think everybody should read Richard Rorty, for example. Uh, anybody who's trained in the Anglo-American philosophical tradition, he's excellent on that. And uh, do precisely that example. And where Rorty makes a good critique, uh, take that to heart and, mm. uh, uh, and and build that into your own new synthesis. Yeah, yeah. Well, last question then for you to wrap this up is sort of, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk, granted for some time, but I think I'm really starting to see this uh, in 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 a big way about the decline of postmodernism, about the uh, the sense that we're somewhere different than than uh, mm. than the postmodern moment, and a lot of those figures that you named earlier um, really had their heyday, you know, uh, in the prior in the late twentieth century, and that we're starting to really see different kinds of art, different kinds of ideas, different sensibilities show up in culture and in in the kind of intellectual sphere. So yeah, just some. What are your thoughts on that? Both in terms of do you see that does that match with your experience that we're sort of getting out of some of the postmodern perspective and if so yes. like where would you like to see us uh going in that direction yeah no i i think uh we are moving in a healthier direction uh and by that i do mean a, a reinvigoration and improvement on the enlightenment model uh i know i think you're right the heyday of postmodernism intellectually was in the latter part of the 20th century so the big names uh, made their mark in the by the 1960s. They became cultural icons inside the academic and intellectual world by the 70s and 80s, trained an entire generation of graduate students who came to prominence in uh, the intellectual world by the 90s. And I think things stalled intellectually uh, by the 1990s. And my, my evidence for that is that when I look at postmodern journals and postmodern publications, I'm not seeing anything new. Mm. Instead, you know, even if we're the 19 or the 20 teens and the 2020s, it's just the recycling of the same tropes and the same kinds of arguments and strategies that you were reading 20 or 30 years ago. So that is the sign of an intellectual movement that's not going anywhere. And said it has institutionalized itself to some extent, but you now have got a bunch of old professors just repeating themselves uh, until retirement or younger professors who are trying to get publications uh, to get tenure, yeah. uh, just recycling the same sort of tropes. So uh, I think that's uh, that's a good sign. And it, it's partly good because, uh, or, or to be expected, because in the intellectual world, we typically attract people who are active-minded and interested in real issues, and they will take any critique, uh, including strongly nihilistic and pessimistic critiques, seriously and play around with them. But uh, that gets old pretty quickly. And if someone comes along with a new, interesting idea, they will get excited and, and, uh, and, and go for that. And there have been a lot of new and interesting ideas coming up in the intellectual worldly more broadly, uh, uh, in the sciences, in engineering, in the social sciences as, as well. And so things are getting back on track in, in many of those. Also, we started to see uh, inside the academic world many 
of the postmodern enclaves or places where they had their power bases, various departments in particular, social study, special programs. You know, they're, they're not being productive uh, in, in terms of scholarship. They're not being productive in terms of attracting students. So, uh, they're, and in some cases, they're, you know, actively anti-intellectual. <laughs> and people are starting to notice this. And so there's lots of inter institutional pushback from that as well. I think also, though, uh, uh, where postmodernism has had its biggest impact, I would say, in the last 20 years has not been in the academic world, but rather it's been training a significant number of students who go on to have careers in journalism. And so we have postmodern journalism where people are just political activists and not at all interested in objectivity or, or accurate reporting. They're just they're doing their agenda or the art establishment, or they become a new generation of indoctrinators in education, or they have their various agendas in law and they go to law school and then they're just pushing a certain kind of political agenda in the law. So we've seen postmodernism then uh, turning into a cultural activist movement in all of these various spheres, but then we become aware of that in those other cultural spheres. And then there's pushback and debates on all of those particular sub issues. And I think we're starting to get some traction and starting to uh, starting to win uh, in, in, a, in a more healthy. So people are taking education seriously right now. We want kids actually to get an education in the law profession. We want there actually to be standards of justice and standards of procedural law right, and, 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 and so forth. We don't want medicine to be just uh, dismissed as a, a sexist European narrative. We want actual medicine. So on all of those cultural fronts, I think people are more alert to the problems that applied postmodernism has created. They're taking seriously the critiques. It's had its day in the sun, so to speak, but we're ready to, uh, to, uh, to get back to reality. Yeah. Well, that's well said in the sense that I, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely see that as well, that there is much more there's much greater sort of public awareness uh, around the term and the in the set of ideas. And I think that, I mean, that's important for how I characterize and, and theorize what we're seeing emerging beyond postmodernism in, in a kind of metamodern context, because it takes being aware of sort of the worldview to be able to stand back from it and then assess it and compare it to sure, other right. worldviews to then be able to make judgments about it. If it's hot and new and fresh, then people just see these ideas and they're like, oh, that's interesting. I've never heard of that or tell me more. After a certain right. time, it starts to get a bit stale and it get a, a, a bit, uh, you know, you get these diminishing returns that you're describing. And eventually, I think there does start the, the, the malaise starts to set in and people do start wondering, OK, what's next? Um, yeah, that's so, right. Uh, yeah. and, and we do have a, a labeling issue. So if, if we want to say what's next and we have the, these big, broad categories, pre-modern, modern, and, and you know, they're, each of them is trying to integrate positions on about 20 different philosophical and cultural views and so on. Yeah, part of the project is to take the meta stance, small m meta stance always. And I think that's mm. what good intellectuals will do. But then uh, to come up with uh, with new labels for their particular integrations. And that's just part of the ongoing process. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, this was a wonderful conversation. Um, I'll very let good. you go. Yeah, but this was really much. great. Thank you for uh, for coming on. And um, yeah, maybe we'll uh, continue the conversation in a, in a future point. All right. Thanks for having me on, Brendan. Really All good right. questions. Enjoyed it.